Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We're coming to you from the 47th Annual Triumph of Ag Expo at the CenturyLink Center in Omaha. With over 200,000 square feet of exhibits, the show says it averages 17,000 visitors over its two days. On this episode of Market Journal, DTN's Darren Newsom explains why he's bullish in the soybean market. We'll show you why there's hope in the future of agriculture on the African continent. Iowa State climatologist Elwin Taylor gives his forecast for precipitation in the Midwest this spring and summer. And world record soybean grower Kip Kullers talks with us from the World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa. Darren Newsom from DTN is our marketing analyst this week. We talked with Darren on Wednesday morning about his bullish thoughts on soybeans, the demand market for corn, and pricing this spring's new crop. As we spoke, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was on its way to making another all-time top. Yesterday we saw the Dow hit a record high. It's climbing again this morning, but on the other side of that, the ag commodities are not. So I want to ask you, because if you go back not too far, there was a relationship between those two. How closely tied are they now? I don't know that they're that closely tied at this point. In fact, one of the threats to uh, the commodity markets, agriculture included, is more interest in U.S. equities and pulling money out of what has been a very strong investment movement in commodities over the years. If we start to see that, if the Dow starts to show some sustainability at these highs, I think that is a real threat to investment interest in commodities, gold, crude oil, and certainly grains. Let's move into uh, soybeans. Brazil is well into their harvest now. Uh, how patient should I be if I'm still waiting for something to go higher? You know, I think if we look at the future spreads, if we look at the way the May contract it relates in price to the July, certainly indicating that the market doesn't really seem to care about the, all this talk of record production in Brazil, that there is still a great deal of concern over where are the supplies going to come from to meet demand this spring and summer. So I think we can be patient. I think the pieces are in place for the soybean market to at some point move higher. We've got incredible demand uh, still going on. We've got strong basis levels. I think there's still some good demand. I think it's going to be there for a while. You think the export market is still there? China has basically met the U.S. has basically met what they need to export that was set up by USDA. Does China still keep buying? I think so. I think you know, we haven't really seen a huge slowdown yeah. yet. Even this week we saw some more announcements of some large old crop purchases of U.S. soybeans. So you know, as long as we continue to see that, as long as we continue to see the spreads and basis act the way they have, I think we're fine on the fundamental side of the market. Did you expect there to be more volatility once we got into this time of the season with Brazil and the news that we would surely get from either weather or harvest? Did you expect to see more of it? Actually, it's kind of strange that when we get into a weather market in, uh, say, South America, we're, we're still looking at a time of year here in the, in the U.S. markets where volatility is relatively quiet because we're waiting for the focus to shift back to the U.S., to shift back to the planting season, the weather markets, and all of this that, that comes with the actual U.S. crop. So I, it's not that unusual to see low volatility during the winter, but as the, you know, the minute we move into the spring, things are going to kick off. Let's move into corn. You presented today on the overall demand market. I'm just going to ask you to characterize a broad question, but you're talented enough to handle this broad <laughs> question. Uh, characterize the demand market for corn right. for me after what we saw in the drought this year. Demand market for corn is quite simply, we have to have steady to growing supplies to be able to continue to meet demand. The last three years, we haven't seen it. So the question is, if we don't see it in 2013, 
does the demand market come to an end? I think it's a real threat. Uh, if we have another weather scenario play out to where there's a drought and we have lower production, I think we could see the demand that's been threatened over these last couple of years simply go away and probably not come back anytime soon. I'll ask about your expectation for acres, but do you think there's a reason to be bullish now based on what's in supply? You know, if we look at our current supplies, no, it's very difficult because we have such low ending stocks and we have a, we, we haven't looked, we haven't ending stocks to use. That's really a quite problem, uh, quite a problem. Again, just as with soybeans, we have very bullish, uh, we have very strong inverse in the future spreads, indicating there's a lot of concerns over supply and demand. If this doesn't, if this doesn't start to ease, then there's going to be a lot of pressure to see that near record production, record to near record production in 2013. Confidence in ethanol? I still think the ethanol industry is going to be fine. Uh, if we don't have the supplies this year, could we see another challenge? Could we see another waiver brought up in 2013? Will it have a better chance of passing? I think so. I'm going to ask you one quick question on wheat, if I may. Sure. Winter wheat, is it, uh, I've, for so long, I, in, and I've asked our wheat market analyst this, I, I've asked why hasn't it run away yet? And, and the thing he said is it, it needs to prove it. What's your analysis of wheat right now? That's exactly right. I mean, traders have bought into a dead wheat crop before, and they always get, they always seem to get burned. So anymore, they, wheat does have to prove that it's simply not there. But the problem is, even in those years where the U.S. doesn't have much of a crop, it's very hard to get the market to rally because it's such a global crop. And so this year, the, as the winter wheat crop starts to come out of dormancy this spring, it's expected to be in some of the worst conditions ever. Probably lose some acres to corn. But by and large, the market just doesn't seem to care at this time because there's so much wheat globally. Does it have steam to go up, though? It could go up. It's going to take a lot of help to go up. Right now, that market, I think, is going to have to follow the others if it's got a chance. We'll see at the end of the month, USDA will release its prospective plantings. Do you have an indication of what you think you might see there? You know, there's all this talk that corn acres could come in 98, 99, 100 million acres. Is it possible? Yes. Is it going to come from, you know, southern plains, northern plains, and far south? Absolutely. Could we see a slight increase in soybeans as well? I think we have to. Uh, so obviously the ones that could get hurt, wheat and certainly cotton. So I would think something along those lines, see some increases in good with corn and beans. Spreads also indicating that that's a possibility. Any hurry to sell any new crop soybeans or corn? Since we just went through the pricing period for insurance, uh, revenue insurance here in February, this past February, I'm really not in a big hurry. That's basically the essence of a put option that establishes a floor price. So now let's see what the market does. Let's see if we see our normal seasonal move higher over the spring, early summer, to provide some better selling opportunities. As Darren mentioned, the USDA's Risk Management Agency has now set prices for crop insurance. The marks set from February's average close, $5.65 a bushel for corn, $12.87 per bushel of soybeans, and $8.44 per bushel of wheat. Next week, we'll take a look at the grain markets with Roy Smith. On the roster of global agricultural players, you probably have to look hard to find any of Africa's 53 countries. So why are others, China for example, making investments in land and warehouses on the continent and why should other nations pay attention? Because at a size of three times that of the United States, Africa holds more than half of the world's uncultivated arable land. Yet increasing production on the world's second largest continent won't come without work. If it can realize its full capabilities, Africa could share a major role in helping the world meet its growing food needs. Potential is uh, fantastic. This statement seems to paint a common and accurate picture of agriculture in Africa. The potential for growth and success on this continent is enormous. My guess is Africa is only doing maybe 15% of its potential in agriculture, both because of a lot of land that could be used for agriculture that's not being used, but even more than that, the extremely low yields that we have in all the crops that we grow. Optimism about the future here must be tempered by the reality of how much work is left to do before Africa becomes one of agriculture's biggest names. A study from the McKinsey Global Institute says this landmass owns 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. The report estimates if all comes together, Agricultural output in Africa could move from $280 billion per year now to $880 billion by 2030. Those are the reasons for hope. Africa has the land, it has the natural resources, and it has the people to succeed in agriculture. What it needs now to make up ground is the money to do so. 
The major hurdles are infrastructure, roads, rural electrification, rural water, just so people can live in the rural areas and transport fertilizers in and inputs in and transport harvest out. Africa also has a vast amount of wealth on its land. 40% of the world's gold, 10% of its oil, with three of the top 15 oil exporters located between its shores. So while there's reason for optimism, there's also concern. Overall stability in many regions is unsure. And when it comes to agriculture, Africa is inexperienced. Some see agriculture in Africa as another Brazil, with similarities in land and growing conditions. But as in Brazil, success in Africa will take time. I think they don't have uh, the infrastructure, the logistics, and the, the culture, you know. So now they are trying actually to import some farmers from many countries, including Brazil. And I think that can be a good way to, to start uh, to increase the production here. It's inarguable the African continent has incredibly high agricultural potential. It's also apparent that it needs to. Africa has approximately 1.1 billion people now. The population is expected to pass 2 billion by 2045, just over 30 years. If Africa is able to reach its full potential by then, it won't be done without many hurdles along the way. As for South Africa itself, the country remains incredibly violent. From April 2011 to March 2012, more than 15,000 people were murdered. Nearly every wall we saw in Durban had some sort of protection. Razor wire, electrical wire, spikes cemented into the wall. While crime remains high, though, it should be noted the unemployment rate in South Africa is nearly 25 percent, similar to Greece or Spain. In terms of agriculture in the country, it remains in a sort of infancy. South African farmers planted just more than 9.7 million acres for crops in the 2013 production season. Iowa State climatologist Elwin Taylor says there's a good chance this year's corn yields will be below normal, but he also believes precipitation will be better than last year. You'll hear in our interview his thoughts on precipitation and temperature for Nebraska over the next few months and his analysis of why farmers here can look to Arkansas for their planning forecasts. First, though, we start off with the good news about winter in the state. Well, it hasn't been near as miserable as we thought. Uh, it's been normal precipitation since the 1st of October. October 1st is New Year's Day for the hydrologist, for the climate year, for the water year. Any moisture that falls after the 1st of October, we count toward next year's water. And since the 1st of October, at least the eastern one-ninth of the state of Nebraska has been normal. So one of the big reasons, right, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the big reasons uh, uh, for last year's volatility was the La Nina, yes? Is that correct? That is it. Okay, so now where does the La Nina stand and where could it go once we get into planting season and into summer? Well, this La Nina kind of fooled some people that hadn't studied these things over the years because this was the second strongest La Nina in history. The strongest was back in the mid-50s. Well. That La Nina, though, if you looked at it on paper, appeared to the La Nina itself to last about a year and a half to two years. The effects went on for four years, and we knew it would do it again, and we're through year three now. We expect some effects to still be here. But not as severe? But not as severe. Okay. It takes that fourth year to get out of the condition that was worst in the third year, 2012, except for Texas and Oklahoma. They had their worst year in 2011. Well, the same thing happened back in the 50s. They had their worst year in 55. We had our worst year up here in 56. The way the precipitation, you showed a graph today that showed the drops in precipitation and the year before and the year after. And based off of that, you think that this year isn't going to be as bad, but it's not going to reach the trend line. Is that, a is that accurate? Well, I only think that because we've only had a year this dry uh, five times before since we've been keeping records in the Midwest. And all five times, it took more than one year to get out of it. And so we assume that this, the sixth time, it will take more than one year to get out of it as well. It might be faulty logic because five isn't much of a number to, sure. to judge on, but at least it's 100%. Yeah. <laughs> what, about, what about temperature? We didn't uh, spend time talking about that today, but what about temperature? Uh, the temperature in the summer is what really counts on this, and the, what we call a stressful temperature. 
Whenever the temperature is over 86, we start to call that it might be stressful for crops because if the crop's a little short of water or has any other uh, things that make it less than perfect, then it temp as temperatures go above 86, it starts hurting the crop. But if everything's perfect, it's when the temperature goes above 93 that it always hurts the crop. So we count the temperature, the number of hours or days that the temperature was over 93 degrees, we know that's hurting the crops. Over 86, it might be hurting the crops. So we call those the stress days. Well, we had more stress units here in eastern Nebraska this past year than we did in 1988, which was a widespread drought here. And so as we pay attention, we can look back and see what years were close to this one in precipitation, in heat stress, mowing degree days, if we want to look at that, because they're important as we go into the summer. If we get extra growing degree days after the corn silks, our yield just takes a nosedive because it matures so fast, it doesn't have time to put on weight. So do you think it's going to hit those stages this summer? I'll be watching as the weeks, week by week goes by. Okay. But we do expect that the precipitation will be shy. We expect that the heat will still be a little above normal. And those will be the main stresses. We can't tell the growing degree days yet. What do you think, uh, why is Arkansas important for this area? Well, it isn't really important, but it gives us a clue. Right, why is it a key? What happens in the winter is the, what we call the Arctic front, the extreme south limit at the present time of the air flowing down off the high Arctic. It has a limit. It's somewhere up in northern Canada during the summer and somewhere near Nebraska border with South Dakota in the winter. Well, as that Arctic front retreats as the days get longer, we see the movement of all the weather patterns go further north. So we're interested in what's going on south of us as that will be moving north to us. So if Arkansas, in the month before we plant the crop, is bone dry, we'll probably have a bone dry planting season. If they're sopping wet, we'll have a sopping wet planting season. I'll ask you this to close out. Where in Iowa is the break line between where it's really dry and where they're pretty darn lucky? Well, if you have to just put one line for it, you'll call it Interstate 35. And that is the break across Minnesota, Iowa, and between Kansas and Missouri, and across Oklahoma, and the break in Texas. Dallas is in a different world than Fort Worth if you're coming in from the east and going west. How much is that difference? When you get up to that east side of it, how good is it? Well, it's, it's almost as good as normal now. And on the other side? It is about a three chances out of 20 of being better than average. One final note from our discussion. If you think 2012 was dry, 2025 could take the cake. Elwin says the combination of tree ring records over 800 years and the relation of sunspots shows the worst weather years happen every 89 years. 1847, 1936, and if the pattern stays on schedule, 2025 could set up to be severely dry. Checking irrigation systems and crops from the air isn't new, but there is a fresh approach to aerial monitoring of irrigation systems, and you can read about it in the March Nebraska Farmer. Aaron Shepherds of Lincoln uses a thermal camera mounted in the belly of an aircraft to check stress of irrigated corn. He says thermal imaging can detect heat stress crops soon enough in the season to fix center pivot application errors. You can read about Shepherds and his cornerstone mapping company in the March Nebraska Farmer. In our recent trip to the World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa, we had the chance to talk with world record holder Kip Cullers. Kip farms in southwest Missouri and claimed a world record by growing 160.6 bushels of soybeans per acre in 2010. He mentioned in his conference address that corn was more of a challenge for him. Soybeans seemed easier. Soybeans are such a forgiving crop. You know, if you're growing indeterminate beans like you would in Nebraska, you know, soybeans are going to bloom four to six weeks. Where corn, you know, you've got that one week tight window that, that's going to pollinate. And, and the nice thing about the soybeans is they are forgiving, which is a lot easier for me than corn. So I find corn a lot more challenging. You say you change everything up every year, is that right? I mean, do you, do you almost start over every year, essentially? It depends. Yeah. We got a couple new tricks up our sleeves we're going to try this year that, that I've been kind of playing a little bit with and I've been thinking a lot. 
about, I spent a lot of time on airplanes, so I, I have a lot of time to think, and it's like, what, what kind of crazy idea can I come up with? And, you know, like I said uh, today, that 85% of my experiments fail miserably, so I got a couple new things we're going to try this year. Hopefully they work, and, you know, if they don't, hey, there's next year. Is it more about the curiosity than the yield for you? It's more about what can I learn to go take to all my normal production acres, because, you know, excluding the last two droughts we've had, you know, we mainly grow soybeans double crop behind wheat or barley or green beans. And we've been able to average 100 bushels across all of our acres and with a, you know, a very, very low input cost on them. So that's the reason I do my experiments. Is what can I learn and what can I take from that and go and apply to all my normal production acres? You said today you, uh, the farmers need to think outside the box. And I can hear the guys at home saying, but my banker wants me to produce X number of bushels. What do you recommend to people like that? Go play on 10 acres. You know, I was in North Dakota one time here a couple years ago and a farmer farmed about 8,000 acres. And he kept asking what this 10 acres was going to cost him. And finally I looked at him and I said, man, if you can't afford to go play on 10 acres and go throw the book at it, you're broke and don't know it. So, you know, look at it like that, 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 you know, just go try something, try something new, try something different. I always challenge farmers all around the world, do something different in 2013 than you did in 2012. Are there easy things, cheap things, seed treatments, uh, spraying at a certain level for aphids that you would recommend, cover crops, leaving residue, anything like that? You know, soybean seed treatment is just a no-brainer. There's no reason everybody's not already doing that. Uh, it's, you can't see one and two bushels from the combine seed. It's cheap. It's a guaranteed payback. Uh, you know, fungicides works really well for me. You know, I don't live in Nebraska, so I don't know how they perform up there, but fungicides is a big key role to us. Uh, we did a new deal last year on our corn, and it's a, it's a new product that, that was developed actually for corn production, for uh, seed corn production, and it, it was Corgens, the name of it, made by DuPont. We had no earworms. It's kind of expensive, but imagine if you have an earworm that eats three ears, three rows around every ear, how much yield we lost there is we had not one kernel damaged in our contest field, and that, that particular field averaged 321 bushels. So that's something new right there that, that I did last year that we're going to go incorporate on a lot of acres next year. What do you look at when you go out and scout? You said you scout every morning. What do you look for? Is it just kind of a trying to be intimate with the plant almost? Almost. I, I'm just kind of a seat of the pants guy. And, you know, I can, you can look and tell, you know, if the plant don't feel well. So a plant's just like you and I. If it don't feel well, it's not going to produce. If it feels good, you know, it don't mind to go jog two miles in the morning. But if it don't feel good, it don't want to do that. So it's, you know, put that back in perspective. If it don't feel well, it's not going to produce. But if it does feel well, it's going to produce. How dry is it in Missouri? What are you, uh, are you, are you concerned about? about that this year? I mean, I'm not as up to date on that part as I should be probably. We're the, the uh, dot where it started at two years ago and it just keeps expanding out. Um, last week, we had our first one inch rain since April of last year. So we're pretty dry. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Of course, we have a major storm system moving through the Central Plains, and we'll get to that here in a few seconds. If we look back at this last week, the system that was expected to possibly give some accumulating snowfalls to eastern Nebraska essentially moved just slightly east of the state and dropped some pretty significant moisture across portions of uh, west central all the way through eastern Iowa. And, of course, that swung through the uh, upper Mississippi River Valley and Ohio River Valley and gave some very good accumulating snowfall. But for us, we do have a pretty significant weather maker that is dropping some significant snow across portions of the Panhandle. And we expect to see that uh, progress eastward as the day goes on. So let's take a look at the upper air models and what we might expect as we go through this next seven day period. And as we go to the upper air models, here is that big upper air trough that is starting to make its way toward the eastern Great Lakes. And on the back side, we have seen accumulating snowfall with blizzard conditions across the Panhandle, and we're expecting to see that slowly slide its way eastward as the day progresses. And possibly by the time we get to this afternoon, late evening hours, we'll start to see some snow developing across central Nebraska. And in front of it, we'll see rain continuing along with some of the rainfall that we had last night might be selecting up towards an inch, maybe even an inch and a half of accumulated moisture in some locations, particularly those that may have seen a little bit of thunder. Now, as we go to tomorrow, we're going to see this system progress rapidly toward the Great Lakes region, and we'll see a definite end to the precipitation across the east as the day progresses. There still may be some accumulating snowfalls, a very brief window, but with the intensity of the storm, 
any snow that does fall will be big wet flakes and it will come, ra come down rather rapidly, but still only expected maybe an inch or two across extreme eastern Nebraska. Northeast may see upwards of three or four inches of snow. Now as we get into Monday, we'll start to see that system progress toward the east. We'll start to see high pressure building in and it looks to be a fairly benign conditions for the remainder of the week. As we get into Tuesday, of course we got a northwest flow, but most of the cold air will remain to the north of us and we'll start to see a warming trend. And then as we get into Wednesday, we'll start to see things kind of flatten out. All the systems will progress toward from the west to the east and most of the activity will remain north of Nebraska. But as we get into Thursday, there is a little bit of energy that may push down some cooler air into northeastern Nebraska. And we might actually see some light precipitation across extreme north central and northeast Nebraska, but the main brunt of the energy will remain well to our northwest. As we get uh, into Friday, once again, we start to see ridge building back in and another trough starts to make its way into the western United States that might bring us some significant precipitation as we get later into the week and the first part of the following week. So in terms of the temperatures, what we are looking at is temperatures basically in the upper 30s to cooling down the, in the northwest as the day progresses. We'll be in the upper 50s as we get into southeast Nebraska with a chance of showers and thunderstorms and that will end as the day progresses and the snow will start to move into central Nebraska. As we get into Sunday, we'll look at highs basically in the 29 to 35 degree range and then we see clearing conditions with a moderating trend as the week progresses with well, just a slight cool down as we get into the Thursday Friday time frame. Now in terms of the temperatures out the 8 to 14 day forecast we're looking for above normal temperatures of that ridge coming in but also as that ridge comes in and the trough to the western United States we'll start to see an increase in precipitation primarily during the second half of next week. Thanks Al. Today's interviews with Darren Newsom, Elwin Taylor, Kip Cullers, and our reporting from the African continent are all available on the Market Journal mobile app. You can follow us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. As a reminder, next week's episode of Market Journal will be preempted on Saturday morning. You can still see the show Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central on NET2 or on the web at marketjournal.unl.edu. Until then, thanks for watching. From the 2013 Triumph of Ag Expo in Omaha, I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.